A single chapter of One Piece revealed so many major things, from the Gorse's name to the former King of God Valley, and man am I hyped, because I think Oda just confirmed about 13 of my most insane theories ever. In this video, I'm going to explain to you each of these 13 theories, how this chapter confirmed all of them, and of course, how I predicted them. So the first theory that seems to be right is Shanks being a celestial dragon. When Oda revealed that Shanks might be a part of the Figureland family in film Red, everyone assumed that that family was a celestial dragon family, but we never knew for sure. After 1086, it's finally been confirmed that Figureland is in fact a celestial dragon family, since we see that the title before his name has the word Saint. Saint is always used for the celestial dragons, for example, Saint Charlos, all of the five elders, the saint in the Don Quixote family, and more. Now, I'm not gonna act like I was the only one who theorized that Shanks was a celestial dragon, but I think the thing that separated mine from most theories was why I believed it. In those theories, I explain how Corzone is an exact parallel with Shanks, and how this ultimately might lead up to Shanks being a celestial dragon who helped the Will of D member. Here's what the parallels were. So the first parallels has to do with Shanks and Luffy's backstory and Corazone and Laws. So Shanks is the Corazone to Luffy. Luffy looks up to Shanks, just like how Law looks up to Corazone. Luffy's crew name is named after the Straw Hat, which is something that Shanks gave him, just like how Law's crew name is named after something that Corazone gave him, since he gave him a heart-shaped devil fruit. Shanks stole the most important devil fruit from the world government specifically, and then Luffy ate it, just like how Corazone stole what's nicknamed the ultimate devil fruit from the world government, and then Law ate it. Shanks saved Luffy's life by sacrificing his body, just like how Corazone saved Law by sacrificing his body. Both Shanks and Corazone bet on the new generation. Law ended up wearing a jacket that had the name Corazone on it, just like how Luffy wore the straw hat, which is something that Shanks gave him. With all of these parallels, yet again, we can only assume that Shanks is a good former celestial dragon that helped the Will of D member, just like Corazone. On top of this, Luffy and Law ended up even becoming allies, which may show that they're tied together. Now, with the next set of parallels, it has to do with their brothers. Shanks' so-called non-blood related brother is a clown, just like how Corazone has a clown brother, since Joe Joker is a clown. Shanks' brother Buggy became a warlord that runs the black market, just like how Corazone's brother became a warlord who runs the black market. Shanks' brother wants to become the king of the world, just like how Corazone's brother wants to do the same thing. Now for the next reason, I said that Shanks is most likely a celestial dragon is because of Blackbeard. We know that Blackbeard and Shanks are natural enemies, and since Blackbeard has the will of D, what do you think Shanks is? We can only assume that he's a celestial dragon. Now the next reason I thought Shanks was a celestial dragon was because he's based off of the god of war, Tyr, since he stopped wars and lost an arm in the very similar way that Tyr did. And since Tyr is a literal god, I was thinking that Shanks probably is too, since in One Piece, gods are the celestial dragons. Now with the latest reveal of the Figureland family, now let's look at something that Whitebeard told Shanks back when they met up. So Whitebeard tells Shanks, when I look at your face, it makes my scars ache. The scars I got from him. Now was Whitebeard talking about Prime Saint Figureland Garland here? I mean we know this guy was the king of God Valley, and Whitebeard of course was at God Valley since he was with rocks. And so, did Whitebeard go toe-to-toe -to -toe with Shanks' dad or his grandpa? Not only that, but Whitebeard even hints that Saint Figureland Garling injured Whitebeard. This is honestly insane and might reveal the true power of Saint Figureland Garling, since if you could scar prime Whitebeard, then that means that that guy was at least Yonko level. I would assume that right now he's probably more on like the Garp level, or maybe even the Whitebeard at Marineford, since he too is probably around their age. Now, if you want to see more insanely accurate theories like that Shanks one, then make sure you subscribe to the channel, because let me just say that I don't even think I've made my best theories yet. I have some insane Sun God Nika, Emu, Gorsei, and Ancient Kingdom theories planned for you guys, and I honestly just can't wait to post them all. I've been working my butt off trying to finish them as soon as possible. I'll also be doing a face reveal at 50k subs, so subscribe if you want to see that as well. Also, please smash that like button if you've enjoyed anything out of this video so far. Each like and comment truly goes a long ways for the support of the channel. Thanks a lot guys. Alright, so now enough about Shanks. The next theory I got correct that was confirmed in 1086 was that Vegapunk created the weapon that was used on Lulucia. In this Emu Medjet video that I made a while back with Preach, I said that the power that was used on Lulucia was most likely made by Vegapunk, and at the time, I got complete hate for it since everyone wanted it to be Emu's devil fruit or some sort of Emu power. In that video, I said that Emu probably commanded it, but I don't actually think that it was Emu himself that actually did it. And now, knowing that it actually was created by Vegapunk, what do you guys think this power actually is? In the Medjet video, I say that I believe Vegapunk created it by using Kisara's light powers or 
or light beams since we know that for some reason Vegapunk always uses Kizaru's powers in a lot of his creations. For example, all the pacifistas have Kizaru's light beams and I believe that all the Seraphim also have them too. We know that Vegapunk can recreate devil fruits and recreate devil fruit powers using the green blood, but why does he always use Kizaru's powers instead of everyone else's? Like just knowing that he continues to use it over and over, I would only assume that he also used it in this power and I mean what happened to Lulucia quite literally just looked like one big light beam or light explosion. Now the next thing I got correct with this emu power was the fact that the world government didn't have it for 800 years and that it was a recent technology that they made. This too got insane amount of hate and I honestly don't even know why because all of my reasons were completely logical. Like I literally said exactly what Draken said in this chapter, why would the world government wait to use it now? Like why did they not just blow up Ohara instead of using a buster call? Like in my opinion at least, the Lulucia power seemed way more effective. Now another thing with this power that's hinted is that it might be an ancient weapon since Ivankov brings it up. I actually do believe that it could be an ancient weapon, I just don't think that it was made 800 years ago. Like, I actually think it could be more like Pluton in the way that we're probably gonna see two Plutons by the end of the series. Remember, Frankie has the blueprints to create another Pluton, while the real original one is in Wano. Also remember that the world government wanted these blueprints but didn't get it, so maybe right after they realized that they're not gonna have an ancient weapon in the final war, they forced Vegapunk to make this power, or use this technology to make it, so they could still have their own ancient weapon. I mean, I feel like the main reason they actually made it was because they didn't get their hands on Pluton, and they probably started panicking, because they're gonna need something to fight against all three ancient weapons. Now, if this Vegapunk weapon is another version of an ancient weapon, then I I feel like the version would be of Uranus since there's already two Plutons and since it doesn't seem like it has anything to do with the sea or Neptunians. If it is somewhat a recreation of Uranus, then this chapter might have confirmed another one of my theories which is that Vegapunk is working on Uranus. Now my Uranus theory is actually completely different and it actually had to do with dragons and Roger's egg since we know that Vegapunk works on Egghead Island and created a bunch of dragons. However that is just a theory and we don't even know what Uranus is yet. So I wouldn't really say that I got that one right. but. Still Still, it still could be somewhat tied together. If you want to check out why I believe Uranus has something to do with Roger's egg and dragons, then check out this dragon video right here. I'll leave the link in the description so you can watch it later. And now let's go back to the Lulucia power real quick because another one of my theories might be confirmed, which is that God Valley wasn't erased from history because of this power. Like I said before, I always stated in my theories, why would the world government not use this power before, like on Ohara? but also on God Valley. When we learn about God Valley, Sengoku tells us that the world government was trying to hide God Valley from the world, and if they really wanted to hide it from the world, like the island itself, why would they not just make it disappear or blow it up? Also, why would they use the Lulucia power on God Valley when we know that there was a bunch of celestial dragons there, kings there, and who knows how many world government members, or Gorsei, or Holy Knights, or I mean we literally don't know who was there, but I'm just saying, why would they use that power on their own people? Now knowing that it's a fact that they didn't have have this power during that time, that ultimately puts up the question, how did God Valley disappear from the entire world? Well, just like how I stated in my God Valley theory, there's a bunch of ways that this could have happened. First of all, we know that Sengoku describes Whitebeard as having the power to destroy the world, and what if he literally destroyed the island? Like what if he awakened his power and sunk the island or completely just destroyed it for it to never be found or seen again? Another thing I believe Whitebeard could have done to make this island disappear is that he possibly could have created a knockup stream. This is honestly complete speculation, but if Whitebeard really can control the continents of the world, then maybe he can control underneath the sea and force the sea and volcanoes under the ground to create a knockup stream in God Valley. Now the next way God Valley could have disappeared is if someone had Fuji Tor's fruit and maybe an awakening of this fruit could have launched the entire island of God Valley up into the sky. Another way God Valley could have floated off is if Kaido uses his flame clouds and we know that he got his dragon fruit that day, so this actually might have happened. Now the craziest way God Valley could have disappeared is if Garp himself punched the entire island with Galaxy Fist and blew it up. Like we already know that he could one shot islands in his old age so just imagine what he could do in his prime. Now the final way I think God Valley could have disappeared is by Shiki. Shiki himself also could have floated the island off just like Fujitora and Kaido. And now let me know down in the comments which one's your favorite and which one you think happened. Now the next theory that I may have gotten right or seems to at least be hinted at in chapter 1086 is that God Valley is actually Ennis Lobby. Now before I tell you how it was hinted at in this chapter let me first explain why I even thought this in the the first place. So in my God Valley theory, I say that it makes the most sense that God 
Broad Valley was located somewhere in the Gates of Justice because if they wanted to hide it from the world, and if they wanted to keep the location for themselves, then why would they allow it to not be somewhere within their borders? The second reason I say this is because there's literally just a huge hole in Ennis Lobby. Now, I know that a lot of people believe that this is where the One Piece is located after Uteron's and Ohara's theory, and that theory is amazing, but let's just be honest, it's still just a theory. Like, I'm not trying to say that this isn't where the One Piece is located, all I'm saying is that there is a chance that God Valley was actually located here. Like, I mean, we know for a fact that God Valley was erased from history and that the island literally just vanished, and where's the only location that seems that an island literally just vanished? Like, at least to me, it seems like Ennis Lobby is the most likely case. And I feel like I'm Gucci Man in 2006 cause this giant hole in Anna's lobby literally makes no sense. Unless God Valley or another island once stood there of course. And now to how 1086 actually might have revealed that God Valley was located at Anna's lobby, notice how Saint Figurlon Garlin is a judge. He's the judge that can sentence a celestial dragon's death. And let me just remind you, what is Anna's lobby again? Isn't Anna's lobby literally the location where criminals are sentenced to death or sentenced to impel down? Isn't Anna's lobby the the judiciary branch within the world government where a judge sentences you to impel down or to death on the spot. And now since Figurland was the former king of God Valley, he was probably the original judge at Ennis Lobby or God Valley. God Valley, just like Ennis Lobby, was probably the original place or location that held the judiciary branch of the world government and where criminals were judged to impel down. I mean, it basically still is the same thing, except God Valley just isn't there. Now another theory with God Valley yet again that may have been confirmed to this chapter yet again has to do with Figureland. Now another thing that I say in my God Valley theory is that God Valley is the moon city just like how Shandora is the sun city. Now the reason I say that Shandora is the city of the sun is because it seems like it's based off the Aztec or Mayan city of the sun or temple of the sun. The reason I think Shandora is the one connected to the sun is because they're the ones who worship the sun god and still have sun god rituals. Now if there is a temple of the sun then wouldn't that mean that there's also a temple of the moon? And now I believe that God Valley was the temple of the moon since it seems to be directly paralleled with Shandora. First of all, I believe that God Valley is actually the Emerald City since they look exactly like each other, and if this is true, then it's parallel with Shandora because it's brought up in the same quote from Bellamy. Now, Bellamy brings up the City of Gold, the Emerald City, and the One Piece, and I believe that the City of Gold is directly linked to the Sun God, while the Emerald City is linked to the Moon Gods, or Lunarians, and then I believe that the One Piece reveals everything about both. It's kind of hard to explain it right here because that video is two hours long and there's just way too much details to go over. Over, so go check out that video because I'm not really going to go too deep into it here. I will say this though, one of the parallels with God Valley and Shandora is that God Valley is called God Valley while Shandora is called God's Land. This may be proof that they're paralleled and that they're both places from the Ancient Kingdom or from the Void Century. Now to how 1086 might have revealed that God Valley is actually the Moon City or at least has ties to the Moon or the Moon Gods. So if you take a look at the former King of God Valley, what does he look like? His face is literally a moon. His hair and head being in the shape of a moon might be a hint that God Valley was connected to the moon. Now one last God Valley theory that was helped out from this chapter is actually Preach's theory and not mine, which is that Shanks' secret base is God Valley. Preach says that if God Valley still does exist, then he thinks Shanks owns it right now, and well since Shanks might be the son or grandson of Figureland, then he actually might be the rightful ruler due to Bloodline. Now another minor theory that was confirmed in this chapter that I got right was that Emu is the creator of the world, and I know that that isn't a complex theory or anything and that pretty much anyone can guess it, but the way I put this together was actually with an Egyptian god. So in that Medjet video, I said that Emu is parallel with an Egyptian god called Amun. First of all, Amun is known as the creator of the world, and Emu is also now confirmed as the creator of the world. Another parallel is that both of their crowns resemble each other with the long length. I mean, just look at Amun's crown, doesn't it almost look exactly like Emu's? Now another thing with Amun is that Amun is the embodiment of hiddenness, just like how Emu is literally hidden from the world. Amun was born in Nun, or the Egyptian word for the void, and isn't this just like how Emu's name means void. Another thing is that Amun created the world from none or from the void and isn't this just like how Emu created the world from the void century. I can't wait to see more on Emu because I want to see if there's even more parallels between these two. And now moving on to the next theory that has even more information now after this chapter, I think Oda finally confirmed that Kuma's bible does have some extreme importance in the One Piece story. So half of my entire dragon theory on how dragon solved the One Piece has to do with Kuma's bible because I believe that Kuma's bible is one of the ancient manuscripts that Ohara reads research to figure out the name of the ancient kingdom. If this is true, then that means that Kuma's bible holds some extreme information to the void 
century, and it really seems likely that it does, since in One Piece, the Noah exists, the Adam Tree exists, Eve Tree exists, and then God Valley and God's Land also exist. On top of that, in recent chapters, I also think that this woman on the cover of the Bible was Queen Lily, and now Tau 1086 might have confirmed that the Bible does have some importance to the story, and mostly to the Void Century. If you take a look at the book that Ivankov shows Sabo, it's called Genesis. This is the book where he talks about the Eternal Youth Surgery, and in case you didn't know, Genesis is the first book in the Bible. This may be a hint from Oda that the stories in the Bible have something to do with the Void Century and how Emu became immortal. Trust me you guys, there's a lot of more evidence to the Bible having something to do with the Void Century and basically telling you what the One Piece is, and go check out that video after this one if you're interested. Another one of my original theories that seems to have been confirmed was actually confirmed in 1085, however, I still think I should bring it up because it's pretty major. So in my very first YouTube video ever, I state that Emu and Moria are direct parallels. The reason for this is because they have scenes that directly parallel each other. Emu walks into a giant freezer that has a giant lock, just like how Moria walks into a giant freezer that has the same sort of looking lock. Emu carries Luffy's wanted poster while Moria carries Luffy's shadow. They both have to walk through stairs and both freezers structure looks like it's built the same. Now in that video I state that since the giant straw hat is at the end of Emu's freezer and that Oars is at the end of Moria's freezer, I believe that this parallel proves that an Oars from the Void Century was the owner of the giant straw hat. However, we can also add in that Emu and Moria are paralleled. Now the way I know they are paralleled even more now is because in chapter 1085 we finally see Emu's power and it looks exactly like one of Moria's moves. Emu uses a move that seems to be a shadow arrow and of course Moria has a move called Spiky Shadow Lizard which is a shadow arrow. I believe that the way Moria defeated Oars in Marineford was probably the same way Emu defeated the Joy Boy Oars during the Void Century and that this scene is a complete foreshadow to that. I'll discuss this more when I finally drop Oars' Joy Boy and subscribe if you guys want to see that full theory because it's finally almost done and should be ready to post within July. Now for the last theory that I want to talk about in this video, it wasn't confirmed in chapter 1086, but I still feel like it really has a chance to become true now, so let me just quickly explain it. So I've been saying for a while now that BV is going to be the next Straw Hat and more specifically the 10th Straw Hat's join. It almost seems like she has to now since she's literally on the run from Emu and I could really only see in her being protected by the revolutionaries or by Luffy and I'm gonna assume that she's gonna probably want to be protected by Luffy instead. Like Sabo will probably still have to meet up with her to tell her about what Cobra told him, but once that happens, I feel like she's still gonna end up meeting with Luffy after that. It also seems very likely now that Alabasta and the Revolutionaries will have an alliance, which is another theory that I made, and now I know that one technically wasn't confirmed yet in this chapter, but still, these last few chapters are really pushing what I've been saying. And now my last guess with Vivi is that she's gonna be in the Elbaf arc, because remember, she was also there with the Straw Hats when they met the Elbaf Giants. Like, I would feel like it would kinda be weird if she wasn't with them when they also went to Elbaf, since they all kind of promised together that they were one day gonna meet the giants again. I also think that if Vivi does in fact become the 10th straw hat, it was ultimately foreshadowed when the straw hats leave Vivi with the X on their forearm and in case you don't know, X is the Roman numeral for 10. I always said that I believe that this foreshadows that Vivi will in fact be the 10th crew member to join. And now this pretty much wraps up everything I wanted to discuss on this chapter and go ahead and click on this video if you want to see the ultimate god valley theory that I've been talking about.